Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Use of Host Response Serum Biomarkers to Distinguish Bacterial from Viral Infections. I'm Cassie Saltman of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. David Engman, Chairman Emeritus of Pathology, Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, Clinical Professor of Pathology, UCLA, Adjunct Professor of Pathology, Northwestern University, and Dr. Carissa Colbreth, Scientific Director of Infectious Diseases, Tricor Reference Laboratories, Assistant Professor of Pathology, University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. Dr. Engman, you may now begin your presentation. Hello. This is a two-part presentation. I will begin by giving background on the use of host response serum biomarkers to distinguish bacterial from viral infection. And I will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Kalbreth on real-world data using an assay that does distinguish bacterial from viral infection in clinical samples. Both Dr. Culbreth and I have received support from Diasorin. There are five types of infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, and prions. Distinguishing two of these, bacteria and viruses, is particularly important because people infected with these agents often present with similar signs and symptoms of infection. They're very hard to distinguish. And the distinction is important because their treatment is different, with bacteria being treated usually with antibiotics and viral infected people treated with supportive care. There are a number of mechanisms for detecting pathogens. In direct detection, we can use microscopy, molecular detection of pathogen nucleic acids, antigen detection of pathogen proteins, and mass spectrometry. Indirect methods include serology, detection of antibodies, or in this case, cell-mediated immunity, T-cell responses to pathogens, and finally, the quality of the immune inflammatory response. And it's the, it's the quality of the response that's the subject of today's presentation. The use of that difference in quality of how we respond to viral and bacterial infections that can distinguish uh, the two major classes of etiologic agents. The quality of the immune response differs depending on whether the infection is bacterial or viral. It's not specific to any particular pathogen, and the differences are most apparent in acute infections. Over time, the in immune inflammatory response resolves as our own immunoregulatory mechanisms uh, kick in. As long as the response is systemic, meaning it's produced throughout the body, sampling of blood can provide bacterial viral distinction without knowledge of the site of infection. This is another advantage of the use of the quality of the immune response to distinguish bacterial from viral infection. During viral infection or bacterial infection, a number of host molecules are induced in the most general way. During viral infection, there is an initial induction of gene expression producing particular molecules, the RNAs for which can be used to distinguish bacterial from viral infection, and likewise in bacterial infection, a different set of RNAs are produced that can also serve as the basis for distinguishing these two classes of infection. These RNAs can then be translated into proteins 
that are produced and shed in the blood, bacterial proteins, viral-induced proteins, that can also be used to distinguish these two classes of infection. And this is the basis for the use of the host response as an indirect measure to distinguish viral from bacterial infection. Notably, two well-known biomarkers, procalcitonin and C-reactive protein, are induced in bacterial infections to high levels. The use of host response to distinguish bacterial from viral infection dates back to 1974 with the first publication on C-reactive protein. So this is one of the first biomarkers that was used and is still used in widespread use today. Procalcitonin was first published on in 1993 that can also uh, reflect an underlying bacterial infection. A number of molecular tests have been developed and several shown here were developed not too long ago. One is a gene expression uh, signature that can diagnose infection in patients, and this has been commercialized into the septicite lab gene expression assay. Another is uh, was identified from investigators at Duke University, and this is another gene expression test that can distinguish bacterial from viral respiratory infections. Finally, a group at Stanford developed a separate molecular signature. Again, these are using the RNAs to distinguish bacterial from viral infection. They can also do this in diverse global populations, including intracellular pathogens. And finally, for this introduction, monocyte distribution width has been found to be valuable in identifying patients with bacterial infection. So this is, again, has been commercialized uh, and this group in, from China was the one who discovered this. What I'd like to talk about today, and this will be used by Dr. Culbreth in the next part of the presentation, is a protein signature found in the blood that can distinguish bacterial from viral infections. This was developed by a group in Israel working at MEMED Diagnostics. And this test, which is called the MEMED bacterial viral test, or MEMED-BV, uh, can distinguish bacterial from viral infection. And I'll describe the discovery of this and development of the assay and the basis for how it works. So what those scientists did is they knew that there were hundreds of thousands of serum proteins that could potentially be used as a host response test to distinguish bacterial from viral infection. They used informatics to narrow that 100,000 down to 600 that they then were able to subsequently test using a panel of 20 very carefully adjudicated patient samples, half with bacterial infection, half with viral infection, known bacterial infections and known viral infections to reduce that 600 to 86. Those 86 proteins were then sub uh, tested with a separate panel of 100 patient samples to reduce that number down to 17. And the 17 then were tested with over 100 new patient samples to reduce that number down to three. And this, these three biomarkers constitute the signature that is used for as the basis for this assay. And those three proteins are CRP, TRAIL, and IP10. These three proteins constitute the molecular signature that uh, constitutes this test. Each one of these behaves differently upon bacterial or viral infection. TRAIL is present at a certain amount in uninfected people. It actually is lowered in its level upon bacterial infection, but goes up in viral infection. The very well-studied CRP is at very low levels in uninfected people, goes up somewhat in viral infection and goes up quite a bit in bacterial infection. And IP10, low in uninfected people, up somewhat in bacterial infection and quite a bit in viral infection. But notably, any one of these individual markers does not provide 
very good bacterial viral discrimination with a lot of overlap in patient samples from virally infected people or bacterially infected people. Same with CRP and same with IP10. It's a lot of overlap here. So that's why each individual marker is not very good at bacterial viral discrimination. It's the integration, though, of the serum concentrations of these three markers that provide that molecular, the protein signature that provides excellent bacterial viral discrimination. Importantly, as I described in the past slide, none of the individual biomarkers does a very good job on its own. No two of the three, CRP trail, CRP IP10, IP10 trail, et cetera, provides that useful signature. And inclusion of additional biomarkers does not improve the effectiveness of the signature. So four or five is not better than three. Three, according to these investigators and their findings, is the optimal signature, three protein signature, IP10 trail, and CRP. During bacterial infection, the bacterial molecules stimulate the expression of a pro molecular and protein cascade leading to high levels of CRP production. In viral infection, the same cascade leads to the upregulation of trail and IP10 on viral infection. However, as I showed a few slides ago, IP10 is also up somewhat in bacterial infection. And that is important, will be important, as you'll see in the next slide, for how the protein works in the settings of when each one of these markers may be at normal levels, depending on the time from infection or symptom onset. So to review, in no infection, the trail IP10 and CRP levels are relatively normal. In viral infection, the trail is up a moderate amount. The IP10 is up very much so, and the CRP goes up a little. In bacterial infection or co-infection, the trail is actually reduced in its concentration. The IP10 goes up a moderate amount, and the CRP, of course, is up quite a bit in bacterial infection or co-infection. When you look at the levels of trail IP10 or CRP from the time of symptom onset, they don't always, uh, they aren't always abnormal across the entire seven days through this particular study uh, from time of symptom onset. CRP is at relatively normal levels for the first day and a half. However, the three protein signature still works across the entire range from symptom onset, because even though CRP levels may be normal early on, the IP10 and trail are not. If there's a bacterial infection, trail is suppressed. IP10 is induced. If there's a viral infection, trail goes up quite a bit. IP10 goes up a lot. So that's why this signature is useful at that very, very early time when CRP may be normal. And likewise, out at later times from symptom onset, the trail and IP10 are less useful, but CRP is still working very well there, including being induced somewhat in viral infection. In this way, this assay is able to distinguish bacterial from viral infection across the entire seven days from symptom onset. The test was commercialized by MEMED Corporation, and then in a recent collaboration with Diasor and Company, uh, the Diasorin uh, offers this on its liaison instrument. Both MEMED and Diasorin have received CE and FDA approval for this MEMED BV test, which is essentially the same test run on different instruments produced by the different companies. The way the test works is that the score by through the integration of the levels of CRP, IP10, and TRAIL ranges from zero to 100, with zero representing a very high likelihood of viral infection and 100 representing a very high likelihood of bacterial infection, with ranges for high and moderate infection with bacteria up here and high and moderate infection with virus here. So the score is zero to 100. 
in the instructions for use, the studies that resulted in the FDA approval, a panel of experts took 285 well-characterized patients that the experts determined were infected either with bacteria, 38, or with viruses, 247. This represents a, only 13% of these 285 samples. This is 87%. So the vast majority of these patients in this uh, development process had viral infections. The same panel of 285 samples was subjected to the liaison MEMED BB test to give scores ranging from zero to 100, with the vast majority, 153 plus 48, being in the viral category and a relatively small number, uh, 20%, in the moderate to high likelihood bacterial category. Note that only about 10% fall in the so-called equivocal zone where the test is not useful for distinguishing bacteria from viruses. And I would point out that uninfected people will give a low score or a high likelihood it, you know, similar to what you would get if you had a viral infection. Uninfected people give a low score. So a low score, either reflects viral infection or no infection. Likewise, if there's a bacterial infection present, even if there's a viral bacterial co-infection, the score will be high. So a high score represents either bacterial infection or bacterial viral co-infection, all right? As expected, among the patients who are adjudicated bacterial, having bacterial infection, as you move up, go from low to high score, the numbers and percentages increase of the samples that will go from low to high. And likewise, if their patients are adjudicated viral and non-infectious, their samples would go increase as the score goes down, right? Very importantly, and the important value of this assay is that if the score is low, zero to 35 in that range, there is a very high agreement between that and adjudicated viral or non-infectious. So 99% of the samples that were adjudicated viral or non-infectious will have a low to moderate score. The agreement is not as good in the bacterial side with the high scores. With a number of patients who were adjudicated viral, giving a high or moderate bacterial score. This may to some uh, be curious, a curious finding, but in reality, this test was really developed to rule out bacterial infection. So this is the important feature of this test. No test will give very, very, very high agreement with bacterial infection or viral infection. However, the test can tolerate a certain number of viral samples giving high scores because the worst thing you do with these patients is you provide antibiotics. However, if you wanna discharge patients without antibiotics, you really wanna focus on this number where a low score gives the clinician confidence that it's a viral infection, not a bacterial infection, to be able to discharge without antibiotics. What is this test approved for? Adults and children over 150 days old presenting to the emergency department or urgent care center or on admission to the hospital who have suspected acute bacterial or viral infection and with symptoms of infection for seven days or less. This is the approved populations for this test. The reason that these are the approved populations is because in the 20,000 or so patients that have been studied in, for the development of this assay and published in a dozen major journals in prospective clinical trials, that the, the vast majority of patients were lower respiratory tract infections or upper or fever without source in children. What is not known, and populations needing further study, are all of these populations, 
very young children, less than 150 days old, patients with cancer, pregnant women, a variety of fungal or viral infections, trauma, et cetera, active inflammatory disease or congenital or acquired immune deficiency. Remember, patients with immune deficiency still have mostly, most of them have immune systems. And the question is whether this test can still distinguish bacterial from viral infection in these populations. So in conclusion, the quality of the host response can be used to distinguish bacterial infection from viral infection. A serum protein signature consisting of IP10 trail and CRP provides a very high agreement between a low signature score and viral infection or no infection and strongly argues against bacterial infection. Knowledge that a bacterial infection is unlikely can reassure clinicians who are otherwise a little bit uncertain about their diagnosis and help reduce antibiotic overuse. Further development of host response assays, not just protein-based assays, but also some of the molecular assays I described at the beginning may enhance clinical care in additional ways. For example, new fever in a hospitalized patient or perhaps the use of these assays to further uh, indicate that it's okay to stop antibiotics. So this is a very important field. A lot of work is being done in these, this area, and we look forward to further development of these assays. I thank you for your attention and look forward to hearing from Dr. Culbreth next. Thank you for that uh, wonderful opening um, from Dr. Eng Engman that really lays the foundation for the use of this assay um, in some clinical practice. And so today I'm going to share with you some um, real life experience um, in an evaluation of uh, this assay um, used on clinical samples in the laboratory. As Dr. Engman mentioned, we are both supported um, as consultants for Diasorin. Um, so this, in this study, we will we collected 71 previously collected uh, residual samples. They were prospectively collected, um, and they were um, identified for use on this assay uh, based on uh, their collection and collection within the sample stability time of the um, of the assay. The samples were stored frozen um, until the time of testing, um, and because this wasn't a full clinical evaluation where we had chart review available. Um, um, we looked at additional laboratory values to correlate the liaison MEMED BV results to clinical findings of infection. Some of these uh, correlates of possible infection, we're looking at uh, previous uh, positive or concurrent positive cultures or molecular result that indicated bacterial or viral infection. We also looked at other factors um, outside of a specific detection of a pathogen, such as elevated white count, um, elevated lactate, CRP, procalcitonin, or if the patient had ongoing therapeutic drug monitoring um, as indicators of possible infection. Additionally, in, if there was an absence of positive culture or a positive molecular result that specifically detected a pathogen, at least two of the non-pathogen specific indicators of infection was required um, in order to correlate um, a, an actual uh, bacterial infection in these patients. And so this is just a demonstration of the scores that were generated um, using the BV assay. Um, the scores were, um, as previously discussed, um, higher scores indicate a high likelihood of bacterial infection that then go into moderate bacterial. There's an equivocal range um, between the bacterial and the viral um, scores, and then there are the moderate viral scores and the high viral scores are the lowest. And you can see in this study, we had a distribution um, throughout all of the values, the high bacterial all the way to the high viral scores. And we'll get in and discuss some of the um, interesting observations that we found with each of these scores. 
as I indicated earlier, um, when we compared the results with other laboratory values, we needed a mechanism of adjudication. Um, since we did not have the chart review um, for the patients available, we used uh, laboratory values. And in this case, this just lays out specifically how we identified if a bacterial infection was indicated based on a laboratory value, um, if a laboratory infection was not indicated, or um, we have a category of indeterminable where we were not able to specifically identify if there was likelihood of a bacterial or viral infection. When there was a bacterial infection indicated, we looked uh, three days prior to and after the sample collection to just be able to give us a sense of um, any factors that could contribute to a positive result. We looked for positive bacterial cultures. Um, as a single monitor, we looked at therapeutic drug monitoring. So for example, if a patient um, had a vancomycin trough um, that was collected and tested in the laboratory, that would be an indication of likely bacterial infection or we looked for the presence of at least two laboratory markers of infection as described earlier. When we identify that a bacterial infection was not indicated, uh, we count that as a presence of a positive viral test, uh, generally by molecular detection, or we looked at this as the absence of bacterial culture orders at all, um, plus the absence of a laboratory marker of bacterial infection. So for instance, if there was an absence of bacterial cultures um, ordered and there was a normal white blood count. The um, patient or the sample was considered um, indeterminable if there were bacterial cultures ordered but were negative, or there was the presence of one of the laboratory markers of infection, but not two of the markers of infection. And so when we look at all of the samples that we tested um, um, as part of the study, uh, we can see that there was a high agreement uh, for the viral categories at the top of the table. You can see that of the 30 samples that indicated that there was a viral uh, target, um, there were uh, only three of those uh, that actually had a bacterial uh, infection indicated, and the remainder of those samples demonstrated that there was no bacterial infection indicated. And that gave us a 90% agreement for the viral call. Um, so this high agreement for the viral or other category, it aids in identifying patients that are unlikely to have need for an antibiotic treatment. When we look at the uh, bacterial calls, and in this group, we had 33 samples that identified as having either high or moderate bacterial call. Um, in these, there were 16 samples that we were able to generate and identify a bacterial um, infection indicated through the laboratory values, um, and then nine where we did not necessarily see a bacterial um, infection indicated. Overall, there was a 48% agreement um, with these results. And these, this lower agreement that's observed for the bacterial uh, prediction is seen in other studies that were described um, for biomarkers for the evaluation of infection. But it's important to recognize that in many infections, um, especially in upper respiratory infections, bacterial cultures are not indicated by guidelines and they may not be collected. And additionally, in the outpatient setting, there's often not additional laboratory markers or laboratory values um, that would be collected um, to be able to support this um, adjudication process just by looking at the laboratory values. So it's important for us to continue to look at other ways that we can uh, uh, understand uh, how to either rule out or rule in bacterial infection uh, when the high uh, bacterial score is identified. One thing that, that we do point out is that in um, 
of the cases where there was no bacterial infection indicated, six of those nine cases, they had no uh, bacterial cultures or tests ordered, further demonstrating that there may be cases where there could be a bacterial infection observed, but there may not be cultures collected to help us um, in this adjudication process uh, to be able to understand uh, the results and the differences um, in what we are observing. But what we wanted to do was to take a look at some of the samples where there was a discordant result between the BV, the NEMAD BV result, and uh, the clinical indication that we observed. Um, so here are two examples. Uh, in the first example, uh, the sample had a BV score of five, which indicated a high viral um, indication. This was an um, emergency department encounter. The patient three days prior had a positive urine culture uh, with greater than 100,000 E. coli and greater than 100,000 uh, staph aureus. In, in this case, at, um, at that three days uh, prior time, um, there was a significant uh, urinalysis with a large leukocyte esterase. The nitrite was negative, um, elevated white count in the urine, and high presence of bacteria in the urine. Um, on the day after the specimen that we tested, for the BV score, there was an insignificant urine culture collection with candida albicans and a generally negative UA with trace leukocyte esterates, um, negative nitrite, and one white blood cell. Um, there was also a positive blood culture, um, but again, a likely contaminant with staph epidermidis, um, actually three different strains of staph epidermidis um, in a separate collection. There was staph hominis and strep mitis. And so this result could indicate that while on uh, the day that the sample was collected, um, the BV score indicated that it was either a viral infection or non-infectious other uh, process, um, that the infection itself had resolved um, because it was the in initial infection was identified three days prior um, and may have been successfully treated. In another sample um, that had a BV score of 28, this is a sample that the score would be moderate viral or other infection um, or other, other process. The patient was admitted um, and the patient had a right thigh abscess. The abscess was mixed with E. coli, strep anginosis, and mixed anaerobes. There was a negative urine culture um, on this patient and the blood cultures were also negative. This score is very close to the equivocal range um, and the patient had an obvious abscess uh, that was drained. Um, and so in this case, uh, this demonstrates that the, the score is getting closer to a more equivocal uh, range and may not have necessarily indicated an active infection or the infection may uh, be in the process of resolving. When we look at some of the samples in which there was a high bacterial score, um, but the results did not necessarily indicate bacterial infection, um, we see some interesting results here as well. In one of these samples, the score was 94, which indicates high bacterial uh, likelihood of infection. This was another emergency department encounter in which the urine culture was negative. So there was a urine culture that was collected, but it was negative. Uh, there was an elevated white count. Um, but here we also see uh, that the it was a neutrophilic predominance in the white count um, and a left shift. The lactate, though, was negative. The patient was positive for opiates, but there were no other cultures performed. These results uh, demonstrate that there is a possibility that there was an early infectious process that was going on in the patient that's likely bacterial in nature, but the only cultures that were collected uh, was a urine culture that did not uh, indicate uh, a urinary tract infection, though there could have been another infectious process occurring in this patient. And the laboratory values certainly indicate that that may be the case. There was another patient that had a BV score of 100, which is a high bacterial likelihood. This patient was an admitted patient who was immunocompromised and uh, was uh, had 
neutropenia, very low neutrophil count. Um, in this patient, there were no bacterial cultures or molecular tests performed at the time of specimen collection. Um, so in these cases, there were either no or few bacterial cultures in, um, ordered. But there were other indications of bacterial infection, as in the first patient who had an elevated white count um, and elevated neutrophils. And in the second patient uh, who was immunocompromised and neutropenic. Um, it, it is interesting um, that these high or moderate bacterial scores could help providers to continue to look for a potential source of infection in immunocompromised or other um, otherwise high-risk patients. And so this demonstrates the potential value of a BV score in a patient where infection was maybe not necessarily immediately identified, but could continue to be evaluated in certain patient populations. So now I wanted to look a little bit more at the actual scores that were generated and compare it to the results that we saw in the laboratory. Again, this is the same slide that was shown earlier with the distribution of high, moderate, equivocal, and moderate, uh, and high bacterial, moderate bacterial, equivocal, moderate viral, and high viral scores. If we dive in and look at each of the biomarkers that contribute to the results, we see uh, similar to the data um, that was shown earlier, that CRP um, that's shown on the far left-hand side of the screen um, is generally elevated in the high bacterial um, and moderate bacterial scores with the uh, red and the orange bars, where in moderate viral and high viral, there's lower levels of CRP. Um, TRAIL, on the other hand, tends to be more elevated in the moderate viral and the high viral um, that is seen in the green and the blue um, bars that are in the middle portion of the panel compared to the high bacterial and the moderate bacterial that are in the red and orange bars on the middle panel. And IP10, as discussed, um, is uh, uh, is represented across um, the different um, uh, classifications and is used um, to help to see some of the differences in um, each of these sections. And what we find to be very interesting, as was described um, in previous studies, is that no single marker is sufficient um, in identifying which, uh, uh, whether it's high bacterial or moderate bacterial or viral, that you really need the combination of all three of the scores to determine the results. And further, when we look at each of these values um, individually, um, this is for um, CRP is on the far right side of, sorry, the far left side of the panel, um, trail, um, are the values in the middle, and then IP10 are the values all the way on the right panel. And what we have listed here are the individual values and highlighted um, with each of the colors, um, red being for high bacterial, orange being for moderate bacterial, green being for moderate viral, and blue being for high viral, are the values that were discordant um, with our laboratory value adjudication. So as you can see in the CRP, in the bacterial scores, the red markers indicate that these scores were called high bacterial, but the laboratory results indicated that they were either uh, viral or other, or basically a non-bacterial infection. And what we can see is that there's a range um, of the distribution of these discordant results that they don't necessarily cluster on either side of the mean. Um, and we can see the same thing for the viral results that um, on CRP, while many of the viral results are quite low, there was one that was a high viral with a very high CRP that we adjudicated um, as likely being a bacterial infection. So that means that there must have been other values um, such as the TRAIL or IP10 value that contributed to uh, that result being considered high viral. 
Um, again, we can see on trail in the middle panel that most of the bacterial scores cluster lower on the trail side, um, while the viral side, um, the viral results are higher for trail. Um, and again, IP10, there's a generally a wider distribution of, um, of the results. Um, somewhat similar uh, between the bacterial and the viral calls um, with some of the bacterial calls trending a little bit higher on the um, IP10 values. And so what our findings here are from this study um, is that these biomarker algorithms, they provide rapid results for the prediction of bacterial versus non-bacterial presentation. And we saw a high viral agreement um, which helps to avoid unnecessary antibiotics in these patients. There was a lower bacterial agreement, and that was from nine instances where bacterial infection was identified but could not be confirmed. It is, again, important to note that six out of these nine had no bacterial cultures um, ordered, and additionally, there were eight samples where there were um, that were indeterminable, in, indeterminable, and had insufficient laboratory results um, to be able to confirm um, or uh, dispel bacterial infection as a cause. These individual biomarker values alone um, have limited value. But together, they can be used to predict the likelihood of a bacterial or viral infection. But really, what is needed at this point are additional prospective studies uh, with clinical adjudication to be able to determine the application of these results um, and how they could impact uh, clinical outcomes in uh, patients with suspected acute infection and in patients with additional underlying conditions. Thank you very much, and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Dr. Engman and Dr. Colbreth, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is, it looks like is for Dr. Colbreth. Where do you see this assay potentially fitting in in terms of utilization from both a clinical and lab workflow perspective? Yeah, you know, I think um, this assay um, has some various opportunities, um, and I think many of the, those applications still need additional study. Um, so starting with the outpatient side, I think there is you know, opportunities for an assay such as this to be used um, in the acute care spaces, in um, the urgent care or uh, emergency department space um, as a potential differentiator for uh, prescribing antibiotics. Those are both settings where we know that there's um, a large amount of antibiotic overuse. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential there. I think the other place where there um, may be potential um, as further studies uh, begin to come out um, will be the um, uh, use of an assay like this um, in a, a hospitalized setting um, that can be used um, to be able to monitor resolution of disease, right? And looking at uh, the value over time to see if a bacterial infection is uh, resolving, um, again, from an antimicrobial stewardship perspective, um, to be able to uh, discontinue or potentially escalate antibiotics um, if that uh, bacterial marker is not uh, going down, um, maybe there may be a need for additional escalation, right? But I think the use cases um, are still yet to be determined. Um, other potential use cases, uh, looking in immunocompromised patients, looking in other patient environments. So the way that I see this essay is that really there's, a, there's many more questions, which is a good thing, many more opportunities to be able to evaluate all of the potential uses um, of an assay such as this, because it does have big implications um, for better antimicrobial stewardship. Um, I might just add uh, uh, exactly those points, uh, but one might be some of the populations that uh, have not been that well studied, including uh, 
these very young infants, you know, less than 150 days old, um, also pregnant women uh, who develop fever uh, is another population that hasn't been well studied. So those are some additional uh, areas for work. Fantastic. Um, it looks like our next question might also be for Dr. Colbeth here. What additional studies would you like to see in this particular area for differentiating acute infection? Oh gosh, yeah. I think you know similarly, right? The, there's there's many studies that that really I think could be done to get gain a better understanding of how to use these biomarker based assays. Um, the the value of these of the biomarker based assays is that we know that generally empiric antibiotics you know, cover most of the common uh, pathogens that we see. And so the issue is not providing the correct antibiotics in many cases in the acute care setting. It's the overuse of antibiotics. Um, and so I think looking in um, unique patient populations, um, looking at um, unique conditions, right? Would this, how could an assay um, such as this, would it be helpful um, in distinguishing prosthetic joint infection, for instance, when an individual is going in for revision um, and should antibiotics be used in these patients? Um, and so there's these questions of, is this infection or not? Is this bacterial or not? And I think those are the type of spaces where um, focusing on antimicrobial stewardship um, and opportunities for avoiding unnecessary antibiotics are places where these biomarker assays could be further studied. I might just add uh, um, cancer patients, uh, many of them, this test might work very well, but not all. And the question is, under what immune circumstances uh, would a particular type of cancer uh, would this test still be suitable versus not? And those, that's another area that uh, could be studied. And um, even patients with immunomodulatory medications. So again, there are a number of unanswered questions there uh, to be resolved. Thank you. Our next question here is, did they compare CRP and procalcitonin to their discordant samples? So I, I think I can take that one. Um, so in our evaluation, we used um, CRP or procalcitonin, if it was available, um, as part of our adjudication of uh, bacterial infection, um, but it was not performed on all patients. Um, and so this study um, in and of itself was not a comparison um, of uh, this biomarker assay to other biomarkers. But I think that is certainly um, a study um, that would help us understand the role of each of those biomarkers um, independently um, when used as, um, for uh, determining bacterial infection. Um, but it wasn't specifically compared for every single patient in the study. I'm familiar with the publications that supported the development of this assay, and I don't recall a, a situation. Certainly, there were some that did compare the MEMED BV test to CRP procalcitonin, but I'm not aware of where whether there were any direct analyses or at least published results on discordant mm -hmm. samples. That might mean the very tiny number of samples that tested low. Uh, viral uh, that were adjudicated uh, bacterial to know whether their procalcitonin or CRP levels might be um, suggest infection, even if the BV test did not. So I don't think that they published that. Thank you. Our next question here that we have is CPT codes assigned for these tests. I I don't know that, Dr. Engman. Are you aware? I don't know the answer to that question. I think we can follow up maybe with a DSRN rep who can reach out to this particular person. Um, okay, our next question here is going to be for Dr. Engman. What challenges do you see facing the lab and ED adopting biomarkers for distinguishing acute versus bacterial infections? You know, the major challenge uh, for this assay, as it was for procalcitonin when it was first introduced, uh, 
is to actually convince clinicians to try uh, a new test like this. Uh, the clinical need for bacterial viral di discrimination is clear uh, to essentially everyone uh, and it has a very good, very high value for ruling out bacterial infection. Um, but before many clinicians are comfortable incorporating a new test like this into clinical practice, um, many would like to try it and see how it works. This is not necessarily a scientific uh, uh, judgment, but it's just human nature to want to see how it works in your own hands. So I think that is the the challenge for any new test that's brought to market is to have people study it, use it, uh, test it in clinical practice, and then make a decision whether to incorporate into the routine workflow. I think if I may add, I, I think the other piece will be that collaboration with the laboratory to ensure that the turnaround time that the laboratory is able to achieve um, can be incorporated into that clinical decision making process. And so that with, with an assay such as this, um, you really need to be able to have both the, the laboratory, um, you know, activity and the clinical um, trust in the assay to have the best um, outcomes and the best uses in reducing unnecessary antibiotic exposure. I would add one final comment, and that is that whereas one of the values of this test is that it can be run in less than an hour in uh, either a low throughput or high throughput manner, depending on the instrument uh, used, there are some uh, people who feel that it has value, even if it had a two, four, or six hour turnaround time. For example, in a patient who isn't particularly ill, discharged uh, with from, a, say, an urgent care center that doesn't have an instrument, uh, sample tested, the results comes back six hours later. And at that point, a decision to fill a prescription that's given to the patient before discharge from the urgent care or not can be used. So there may be uses of this besides uh, requiring a decision within an hour or two uh, in some settings. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question here that we have, um, Tricor, how often do you do a blood draw as part of normal practice in the ER for LRTI or URTI? And do you see that as a limitation for the BB test? Yeah, so I don't I don't have the specific data on how often um, the blood draw occurs um, in those in those clinical scenarios. Um, but in the ED, there's you know usually no shortage of blood collection <laughs> that happens, and it's a pretty standard practice. So really, I think I think the more um, pertinent question would be, um, you know, are would clinicians and would facilities be interested in incorporating a blood draw as part of that? And I think if the data can be uh, demonstrated that it produces a valuable result, that may not in and of itself be a heavy lift um, to be able to add a blood draw. Um, and, and many clinicians that I've had the conversation with, they would be open to adding a blood draw. And that would just occur at, at the triage point. Um, and, and we could begin running tests uh, when the patient comes in and, and the initial triage uh, uh, begins. Um, so I don't think that would be a, a large burden um, or a heavy barrier for us to be able to address. I, I would uh, add that there are quite a few clinicians who, if they didn't otherwise have to take blood in an uncomplicated individual, might choose not to do this test uh, if the patient is not very ill, appears to have a, a viral infection, et cetera. It's, the test is more valuable, I think, for patients where there's some concern. There might be a clinical judgment that it might be a viral uncomplicated infection that will just resolve uh, on its own with supportive care. But if there's a doubt, uh, I think that's where the test can be valuable in that subset of patients. Thank you. Our next question here that we have is going to be our last one that is unfortunately the last one we have time for. It looks like it's for Dr. Colbreth. Were there any surprises you saw from the initial data that you care to expound upon? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, I think the the surprise for us was that when we initially reviewed um, the results, we did not think that there was a very strong correlation. When we initially reviewed the results and we we started out with just looking at um, the results from the MEMED assay compared to culture results, and we just were looking at culture results by themselves. <laughs> Um, that initially did not show a very strong correlation. It wasn't until we looked at some of those non-culture indicators of potential infection, um, because there were so many cases in which cultures were not collected. And that's what we know to be true about many upper respiratory tract infections um, and other acute infections um, in the kind of ambulatory environment is that the cultures may not be collected, that um, antibiotics are prescribed based on clinical judgment and symptom assessment. Um, and so when we went back and we looked at other available indicators that bacterial infection may be present, that that is when we really started to see the potential value of, of the assay. Um, and so, you know, that I think for us, that was that initial, the initial surprise, because at the beginning, we almost said, this may not, this may not be worth it, this may not work, and it may not be worth further investigation. But when we really started to look into more of the laboratory data, that's when we got more curious. Um, about the potential use of this assay. Um, and, and these are things we continue to explore. Wonderful. I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Ingman and Dr. Colbreth, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Um, before I go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions that we did not have time for today. And those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>